中美元首会晤，向世界传递积极信号。I think meeting in person gives them the opportunity to discuss things in more detail, to really have a very fulsome description of what the problems are and what the potential solutions are. 美中期选举悬念散去。对华政策会否调整 ？That we need America needs to get its own house in order. At that point, is able to compete with China. 风云对话专访美中关系全国委员会主席欧伦斯。十一月十四日下午，国家主席习近平在印度尼西亚巴厘岛同美国总统拜登举行会晤，两国元首就中美关系中的战略性问题以及重大全球和地区问题坦诚深入交换了看法。在中美关系发展史中，有一个群体至关重要，那就是美国的知华派专家，美中关系全国委员会主席欧伦斯就是这其中的代表人物之一。现年七十二岁的欧伦斯与中国结缘超过四十年，他曾亲身参与美中建交和第一轮外国企业对华投资，见证并参与了中美关系发展的各个阶段。Hello, Steve. It's great to see you again. Welcome on Talk with World Leaders. Now the leaders have met at the G20 summit. What do you think it will mean for the development of China-U.S. relations? Well, first and foremost, well, Nancy. First and foremost, it's great to see you. Albeit, I much prefer that it would be in person rather than via Zoom. It will be the first time that they've met in person since Joe Biden was a vice president of the United States and Xi Jinping was vice president of China. So it's been more than ten years. I think meeting in person gives them the opportunity to discuss things in more detail, to really have a very fulsome description of what the problems are and what the potential solutions are. I think we will have some、uh, positive outcomes,、uh, most likely related to climate change. If we go our own independent. Roads. This world is not going to be in a good place 20 years from now. I think the Chinese leadership realizes that. I think President Biden re realizes that. I think John Kerry and Xi Jinping realize it. And I think that is one of the areas where we can see some cooperative outcomes because the political foundation for cooperative outcomes has been laid. The American people understand it. The Chinese people understand it, and they're committed to trying to do something constructive. 即使在中美关系遭遇严重困难的时刻，支持中美交流合作的力量却从未缺席。成立于1966年的美中关系全国委员会，就是中美关系发展历程的见证者和推动者。半个多世纪以来。从1972年中国乒乓球队首次访美的接待工作，再到长期以来的中美高层对话与合作、中美学生交流项目、中美间的重要时刻，都有美中关系全国委员会的身影。十月二十六日，中国国家主席习近平和美国总统拜登向美中关系全国委员会年度颁奖晚宴致贺信。习近平希望美中关系全国委员会和关心支持中美关系的各界朋友继续发挥积极作用，助力中美关系重返健康稳定发展的轨道。Now, not long ago, on October 26, President Xi Jinping sent a congratulatory message to the annual gala dinner of the National Committee on U.S.-China relations, and on the same day, U.S. President Joe Biden also sent a message to the committee. How would you interpret these interactions? Both presidents sent a message to the committee because the committee is in a somewhat、uh, unusual position today. Uh, both the American government and the Chinese government have a good deal of faith in the committee, in its honesty, in its integrity, in its ability to stand up for constructive U.S.-China relations. So President Xi wrote a letter, and President Biden wrote a letter at our annual dinner, emphasizing the need for an institution like the National Committee and emphasizing. The fact that we need to have a more cooperative relationship. So I was thrilled. I was honored 
um, to see, to receive these letters. They were read. The Charge Qinggang was back in Beijing for the 20th Party Congress. So the Charge read the letter uh, from President Xi and uh, sec former Secretary of the Treasury Jack Lew read the letter from uh, President Biden. It seems leaders of both countries value the contribution done by the National Committee. What would you say is the role played by the National Committee on China-U.S. relations historically? Well, it's been, yeah, it's been around since 1966. Uh, it hosted the Chinese ping pong team um, and was a major participant in ping pong diplomacy. Since then, it has hosted every senior Chinese leader that has come to the United States. The role today has actually become even more important. In fact, I would argue it may be the most important that it has been since 1972, because the channels of communications between the governments are deeply challenged today. So it's important that we have track to, that we have informal interactions between the United States and China, and that is happening a lot. It's also really important that at a time when we're not able to travel uh, to China, and ch very few Chinese are coming to the United States, that we continue to educate Americans about China and Chinese about America. So that role has also increased in importance. So, over the last 50 years, we've continued, you know, we've persevered in the belief that a constructive U.S.-China relationship benefits the American people and benefits the Chinese people. It's absolutely true, and it's more important than ever that the committee continue its work. I'm looking for competition, not not, uh, not conflict. And so what I want to do with him when we talk is lay out what, the, what kind of each of our red lines are. Let me be direct about the competition between the United States and China. We do not seek conflict. We do not seek a Cold War. We do not ask any nation to choose between the United States or any other partner.美国将与中国展开激烈竞争，但同时确保竞争不会演变成冲突。自拜登政府上台以来，对华战略从竞争、合作、对抗三分法调整为投资、结盟、竞争三点论，唯一不变的是竞争，并鼓吹未来十年将
uh, State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi received a courtesy call from the U.S. Ambassador of China, Nicholas Burns, and pointed out during the meeting that the U.S. should not try to deal with China from a position of strength and stop aiming to suppress and contain China's development. Also, on a phone call with U.S. Secretary of State Blinken, he pointed out the U.S. side must stop its actions meant to contain and suppress China. How do you understand Foreign Minister Wang Yi's remarks? You know, Secretary Blinken, what Nick Byrne, what Ambassador Burns is talking about is, you know, President Biden has said, invest, align, and compete. Invest is about strengthening America, that we need, America needs to get its own house in order. And at that point is able to compete with China. But my view is that competition should be economic and diplomatic, but not strategic. Sinologist Harry Harding said there are three levels of competition. There is the economic level. Well, we compete with the French, the Germans, the Mexicans, the Canadians, that's fine. We compete with the Chinese, that's fine. That's not a problem. Our diplomatic objectives don't necessarily align, but that's okay too. We use diplomacy, we use international organizations, we find that we come up with ways to achieve our goals through diplomacy, just as China does. Strategic means that we use our budgets to fund our military in order to be able to uh, compete strategically with China. And China does the same vis-a-vis -vis the United States. I think that is unwise, it's unnecessary, and our leaders should find way that we don't do that. Because when we do that, when we fund what I call the military industrial complex, that money has to come from somewhere. It comes from social programs, economic programs, education, it comes from all these things that we should be funding. That is not good. Whenever I ride the subway in New York, which I do on most days, I'm always appalled at America's infrastructure. And I always think, wouldn't it be nice if China and the United States could use some of that money we're using to build airplanes and missiles and other things and use it to improve American infrastructure or improve things in China, which aren't part of you know, the military. And that would be such a better use of the funding but because the governments have now called the competition strategic, it's requiring a redirection of funding into the military, which obviously punishes the lower income Americans and lower income Chinese and is ultimately not good for the peoples of either country. We've seen German Chancellor Olaf Scholz made his official visit to China recently, and he noted Germany firmly supports trade liberalization, supports economic globalization, and opposes decoupling. It also stands ready to closer trade economic cooperation with China. How do you interpret the fact that Germany and other European countries not following the U.S. stance? The U.S. is not decoupling. There are areas, there are industries, obviously chips being the most prominent, where we are restricting, the United States government is restricting uh, exports to China. Um, it is not a wholesale decoupling. And the supply chain remains very much tied to China. U.S. businesses that are in China for China are staying in China. The surveys done by the, um, the various American chambers throughout China show that American companies remain profitable and remain committed to the Chinese market. Neither the Europeans or the Americans want to decouple. What the U.S. is aiming to do is not to fund the Chinese military or not to supply the Chinese military. And they're trying to create these rules which prevent that from happening. My view, again, I probably don't represent the majority, is that those rules are overly broad and they don't make sufficient distinction between stuff that would go to the Chinese military and stuff that just for plain commercial uses. And what we should do is have end use verifications 
where we know where these chips or other materials are ending up and therefore can limit those which are actually going to the Chinese military. Uh, so I, I, I don't agree that there is a wholesale decoupling between the United States and China. And when you talk to US businesses in China, they don't think so either. But if we look at the semiconductor fields, now the US recently urged its, its allies, including Japan and the EU, to follow its lead on restricting exports of advanced semiconductors and related technologies to China. What impact do you think this move would have on China-US trade relations and the global supply chain? Well, I think it has a very negative effect. US semiconductor companies that are publicly listed have been required, have decided that they need to announce the reduction in revenue that they're having. Um, it is certainly disruptive to the global supply chain, but the U.S. is attempting to reshore some of the uh, chip manufacturing. So the CHIPS Act you know, has allocated, I believe, $52 billion to create chip manufacturing in the United States and some have um, broken ground in Arizona and Ohio to start down that process. It's a lot of subsidies that go on. Governments throughout the world subsidize chip production an awful lot. So the U.S. is trying to kind of level that playing field. I believe that these restrictions on exports are overly broad. It's not law, it's regulation through simply amending or clarifying the regulations so that it doesn't have as deep an effect as it might have. And we've already seen that some companies have been given exemptions from these rules, one year exemptions. So we'll see what happens in a year. It was a good day, I think, for democracy. And I think it was a good day for America. The Democrats had a strong night. And we lost fewer seats in the House of Representatives than any Democratic president's first midterm election in the last 40 years. And we had the best midterm for governors since 1986. 而共和党以微弱优势接近众议院的多数席位elections. How is that going to affect Biden's future policies? If it's only the House that is Republican, we will see a number of investigations of the executive branch. You know, they believe that the investigations that the Democrats did of Trump uh, when they controlled the House and the Senate were inappropriate, so they will see those. We might see investigations of um, U.S. businesses that are doing business in China because the, the Republicans have taken a very harsh anti-China stand. Uh, so we might see CEOs of companies being asked to testify about why they're doing business in China and what the benefit is to the American people. The Senate obviously is has an advice and consent function, so they would if it becomes Republican, they will block appointment of judges. They will block appointment of ambassadors they don't like. It will be, uh, it will create significant gridlock in the U.S. government. Do you think it would stifle President Biden's presidency? It will certainly um, make it more difficult for him to accomplish uh, his agenda. You know, historically in the United States, in the midterms of the first term of a president, they, they lose the House of Representatives. It's very, it's happened, I think, the last five presidents it's happened. Um, so they are used to kind of compromising in order to accomplish part of their agenda. Um, I don't know um, if 
these these Republicans are willing to compromise with Biden. Certainly, the uh, the initial signals are they're not very interested in compromising. I worry that um, Speaker McCarthy has already said he would like to visit Taiwan, just as Speaker uh, Pelosi did earlier this year, which again is not in the interest of the American people. Uh, it's unnecessarily provocative, but if that's what he's already said he wants to do, and I'm sure it would take a very significant uh, number of congressmen with him. So it might make it more difficult for President Biden to harvest some of the low-hanging fruit for U.S.-China relations. I mean, I've advocated, obviously, the cutting of the tariffs, the reopening of the consulates, clarification of you know what exports will be restricted, reopening entirely the Chinese media in the United States, having China invite back all expelled journalists from China. I mean, these are things which should be so simple but in this toxic atmosphere is is much more difficult. And Steve, what are your predictions? I believe the House is likely to go to uh, the Republicans. So we will see Speaker McCarthy. But it'll be a very narrow margin. Now, the Republicans uh, did not have the red wave that they expected to have. A uh, combination of election denial. The American people did not like candidates who said that President Biden wasn't president. That was part of it. And then the Dobbs decision, the decision by the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade, energized lots of Democrats uh, to go out and vote. So the turnout was great. They ended up electing a lot of Democrats where people thought they wouldn't be. Steve, I know you mentioned uh, a few things already, but I'm going to ask this again. How do you think the results of this election is going to affect the future direction of U.S. policy towards China? There are very few issues in the United States where there is a bipartisan consensus, but there is a bipartisan consensus in the House and in the Senate that the United States policy towards China has been too easy, not tough enough. So the fact whether the House and the Senate are Democratic and or Republican won't have uh, a major effect. Um, they are going to still be harshly anti-China, which is why I go back to my discussion of the Shanghai Communique, that it's up to our leaders to basically do things which benefit the peoples, even though the political environment wouldn't favor them doing that. You know, sometimes the, what the political environment thinks is right is not right. It's not right. You know, I've been talking recently about, you know, my opposition to America's war in Vietnam when I was a kid, when I was, you know, a freshman at Harvard. You know, I opposed the war in Vietnam and it was I was a minority, but the political environment in the United States allowed us, almost required the president to increase troop uh, deployments, to increase the draft, to do all, all these things. Well, a lot of people like me oppose that. So ultimately, the bottom up, so the people kind of said, this is bad for the American people. And ultimately, the leaders Listen, in the case of the Shanghai Communique, it was the leaders who said, we need to do this. And they did it. That they broke through this toxic political environment and they had the Shanghai Communique, which ultimately allowed us to establish diplomatic relations. And after the establishment of diplomatic relations, we haven't had any wars in Asia. After we established diplomatic relations, we put in place a structure which allowed for peace. Um, and we should fight to preserve that. Today, we will be able to do the work of 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 the